The marketplace for project management is changing. It's changing significantly. The majority of the information that I'm talking about here uh, was in this new book that came out last February, February of this year, because PMI and people kept, and other companies kept asking me, what changes have taken place in project management? And sometimes you have to take a step back in order to see what changes really have taken place in the project management spectrum. I want to talk first of all about the growth of project management and some of the more significant changes that have taken place. There's probably 50 changes that have taken place in the last several years in project management. I'm going to talk about 30 of these, some of these longer than others. The first one, project management approvals. Historically, project managers were not allowed to participate in the approval process of projects. Why? Because the two things that project managers historically knew nothing about was one, business, and two, how to manage people. Because project managers notoriously came out of engineering. When I was a project manager in industry, you couldn't be a project manager unless you had a PhD in an engineering discipline. All of that has changed. Now project managers are being brought on board early. The second one, types of projects. Historically, project managers managed only projects that were operational. Strategic projects were managed by functional managers. And it's taken us 30 years to figure out we had the wrong people managing those projects. Most strategic projects are at least five years in length. So you give it to a functional manager to manage, and then you give that functional manager a year-end bonus based upon 12-month profitability. When do you think that functional manager is going to assign the right resources to that five-year project? It's going to be in the fourth quarter of the fifth year because that functional manager wants to retain the best resources that impact his or her Christmas bonus for the first four years. Now putting project managers in charge of those projects becomes really critical. Project management now goes all the way up to the corporate boardroom. It's not something that stays in the functional areas any longer. It's all the way at the top. For companies like IBM, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, project management is not a career path. It's a strategic competency. It's one of the four or five strategic competencies in the company necessary for the survival of the firm. And trust me, they're catering to it. So there's all sorts of changes we can go through. By the way, you'll have copies of these slides. Copies are available. Take a look at the definition of success. The second one down. Historically, how do you define success? How did we measure success in the PMP exam? Getting the job done within time, cost, and scope, right? But the problem is you can get a project completed within time, cost, and scope and not create any business value for the company. We're now redefining our definition of success. Today, the definition of success on a project is when business value has been created. And notice that planning and scope changes can now exist all the way through the project. Why? Because we're taking more risk. We're taking significantly more risk on projects. On the third page, the ones I want to talk about here, the one that talks about the amount of documentation. We're now trying to eliminate as much documentation as possible. We're trying to go to what we call paperless project management. Therefore, what am I going to replace the paper with? The answer is dashboards on your computer. We're going to dashboard project management. Yes, paperwork is still needed, but we're trying to minimize the paperwork. And in order to go to dashboards, we're going to need significantly more metrics than just time, cost, and scope. You notice the first one up there, overall, I'm sorry, first one on the uh, previous one, number of constraints. We talked about competing constraints. PMI now talks about competing constraints. For years, I shouldn't say years, I should say decades. What were the only constraints we looked at? Time, cost, and scope. We knew when we created earned value measurement in the 1960s that you cannot determine 
the health of a project just from time, cost, and scope. We knew that in the 1950s. So why did we look at just time, cost, and scope? Because we didn't know how to measure it, measure any of the other constraints. How do you measure value? How do you measure goodwill? How do you measure customer satisfaction? How do you manage image or reputation? Now we know how to measure it. And you know who taught us how to measure those things? Divorce attorneys. <laughs> See, you're laughing. Now let me give you the rest of the story. A husband and wife are getting divorced, and one of the two has a very good business. A lot of clients, a good image, a good reputation. How do you determine the value of that business in order to carve it up equitably in a divorce settlement? Now it's not funny anymore. Now you begin to realize that we've learned a lot of stuff from these divorce attorneys on how you measure goodwill, image, reputation, value. And now we're bringing a lot of that into project management. Look at the last one on this page. For years, we told customers, don't worry, stay away from the project, and we'll give you a deliverable. Now we're telling the customers, we welcome your input. We welcome your input. The relationship between customers and contractors is now getting much better, significantly better. Customer involvement is now mandatory. Organizational project management maturity is mandatory. One of the things I've been telling my clients, before you hire a contractor, ask to find out how mature they are in project management. Ask them what assessments they've made so that they can show you in a proposal how mature they are in a project management discipline. What's the single most important characteristic of Agile that makes it work? If I told you to pick one and only one characteristic on what makes Agile successful, what would you say? Dead silence. Because you've never thought about it. You know what the answer is? Because executives are now trusting project managers. We are now providing more trust in the project managers. We want project managers not to make project decisions, but to make project as well as business-related decisions. If you're a project manager now, you're not managing a project. You're managing part of a business. That's how you have to view it. You're managing part of a business, and we expect you to make business decisions as well as project-related decisions. And if executives don't put trust in the project manager, Agile is never going to work. Never. And the life cycle phases, I'll show you in about 10 minutes that the traditional life cycle phases that we've been teaching you is going to become obsolete. It's now going to be called investment life cycle phases. Stakeholders are now expected to make informed decisions. In order to make an informed decision, rather than a guess, you need metrics. And you need those metrics rapidly. I have a client in Spain. Whenever the executives in that company walk into their office in the morning, they turn on their computer, and they log in on a crisis dashboard. A crisis dashboard. That crisis dashboard lists every metric on every project that is out of tolerance. And that executive knows right on the spot which projects are in trouble and which metrics on that project are in trouble. And then the executive knows where and when to get involved. If the executive doesn't see any of those metrics on the crisis dashboard, the executive knows that those projects are performing well. And this company has been using crisis dashboards for the last several years. I've done seminars where I show up early, 7 o'clock in the morning, and suddenly I see a half a dozen people sitting in the room on their laptops. And I ask them, what are you doing? 
they said, we have to update our dashboards for the client before 8 o'clock in the morning. So we showed up here early to get a head start on updating the dashboards for our clients. And that information has to be transmitted quickly. Tell me, how quick can you update a dashboard? Let me rephrase it. Where does the information come from that goes on the dashboard? It comes from an Excel spreadsheet. How quickly can you update an Excel spreadsheet? I rest my case. I can get the information on dashboards in fractions of a second. All I got to do is input a number on an Excel spreadsheet, and the dashboard's automatically updated instantaneously. One of the benefits of PM 2.0 is we're now heading into an environment which we call distributed collaboration. When I was a young project manager in industry, I could not talk to anybody except my project sponsor. You got to picture this. My projects are sitting with eight and nine zeros and no decimal point, and I can't talk to the customer. I can talk only to my project sponsors, and they handle the communication with the customer. All of that has now changed because we have more trust in the project manager and we have what is called distributed collaboration where project managers get to communicate with everybody. PM 2.0 is going to be using more of the social media software that we're using today. You know what the most important communication tool is going to be for the project manager? Your cell phone. We're going to be distributing information over the cell phone. You'll be able to sit at your laptop anywhere in the world and update an Excel spreadsheet. You'll be able to pick the apps you want on your cell phone. I had an executive at Microsoft in Japan. She told me that right now she believes there's at least a thousand people working on project management apps to go on these cell phones for project managers. And she told me that all these people working on these project management apps are under 25 years of age. Some of them are under 20. She said the biggest challenge is how do we provide information security with regard to the apps? She said that's what we're worried about at Microsoft, because our project managers will have thousands of apps to select from. In other words, you'll be able to customize your cell phone with the project management apps you want to use. All of it's going to come off of the cell phone. The information will be transmitted over your cell phone anywhere in the world. And you'll be able to validate that performance is taking place on that project. And because of the quality of the graphics, you should have no problem reading the metrics on the cell phone. No problem whatsoever reading those graphics on the cell phone. Wherever you go, anywhere in the world, you'll have the status of your project at your fingertips. All you need is a cell phone, an iPad, or any type of mobile device, and you'll be able to see the status of your project instantaneously. The decision-making process on projects will improve significantly, significantly. But with anything new, you know there's going to be headaches, right? You know it's not as simple as I just painted this picture, right? One of the problems we're going to have is metric mania. What do I mean by metric mania? You're going to have in your company a library, a metric library. And at the beginning of each project, you'll be able to go into that library and select what metrics you want for that project. But right now, we're finding that people are adding metrics into that library that shouldn't be in there. I read a book a year ago by a colleague. The book's entitled 18,000 Metrics. He's got 18,000 metrics in that book. There's a website that you can go into called kpilibrary.com. You go into the website kpilibrary.com, they have 6,000 metrics in their library. You type in the industry you're in, and they'll tell you what metrics are appropriate for that industry. If you want to find out how to use those metrics, ah, 
take out your credit card, now they're going to get you. They'll tell you the metrics. You want to see the numbers? You pay for that. We're now having difficulty differentiating the difference between a good and a bad metric. That's why we have PMOs. Because we're giving the PMO the responsibility to manage those metrics and to continuously update those metrics. What metrics are good? What metrics are bad? And of course, we have a risk. The risk is we can end up with metric overload. You know that. You have too many metrics in there, it becomes difficult differentiating which metrics are good and which metrics are poor. If you have information overload, be very careful. You will then be inviting the stakeholders to micromanage your project. The balance that you have to achieve is finding the right metrics for the stakeholders that give them the value they want and they know the status of the project. If you give them too much information, it's an invitation for bad things to happen. Very bad things, which is unfortunate. So what are the driving forces? What are the driving forces for better metrics? Look, one thing we don't want is for people to have to read through reports to find out the status of the project. When I managed an industry, 25% of my budget was attributed to report writing. And I'm dealing with engineers that are illiterate, and they all have PhDs. And they can't write a coherent sentence. And now they're spending hours, days, weeks, and even months writing reports for the client, and the reports have to be rewritten. They want to do technical work. When I negotiated for resources, I had to specifically tell every functional manager whether or not reports had to be prepared on my projects so they would assign resources that had writing skills. Because not all resources have writing skills. By the way, you hear me criticizing engineers. I'm an engineer. I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people. When I worked on my doctorate thesis, my advisor read the first chapter and said, you're illiterate. He gave me a book called Harb Race's College Handbook. He said, I want you to read this cover to cover and take an English course before I read your next chapter. I dedicated my first book to him. I told him, this is from your illiterate PhD student. His name still appears in the book. But executives had to go through pages and pages and pages of reports to find the one paragraph they wanted. So what did we do? We color-coded the pages in the reports because we know that the executives aren't colorblind, they can find the right pages. Now we're replacing all that with dashboards. We need to be able to go to paperless project management. We need to provide metrics where executives can make decisions based upon evidence rather than guesses. The growth in metric management is inevitable, inevitable. And the last bullet on here, our definition of success is changing. I am trying to get PMI to change the definition of a project and the definition of success in the next edition of the PMBOK Guide, which will come out in 2017. Here's the PMBOK Guide definition of a project and my definition. The PMBOK guide of the, their definition of a project is a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product or service. I don't like that definition because you can create a unique product or service that adds no value to the company. So why are you working on that project in the first place? My definition of a project is a collection of sustainable business value that's scheduled for realization. If that's the definition of a project, then how do you define success? The traditional definition of success is getting the job done within the triple constraints of time, cost, and performance. My definition of success is achieving the desired business value within the competing constraints. You can have as many as 10 constraints on a project. 
And guess what? When you have that many constraints, unless you go to Hogwarts and you have a magic wand, you're never going to get the job done within all 10 constraints. You're going to have to do trade-offs on some of those constraints. I'll give you an example. I, cons I used to consult for Walt Disney. At one point, I trained all their project managers at Disneyland and Disney World. The project managers designing all of the rides, the attractions. Going all the way back to 1955, when Disneyland was open, we had six constraints on all those projects. We had time, we had cost, and we had scope. But we also had safety, aesthetic value, and quality. Which of those six constraints will Disney never sacrifice? Never. Safety. Which of the other five will they not sacrifice? Pick two. Quality and aesthetic value. So Disney knows right up front, anytime there's a trade-off, you're never, never, never allowed to sacrifice safety, aesthetic value, or quality. All the trade-offs are done on time, cost, and scope. Gee, this is the same way we're defining success, not at Disney. So you, you begin to see up here that that triangle that we call the iron triangle that has time, cost, and scope, for three decades, anytime there was a change that took place and we had another constraint like image, reputation, risk, or quality, what did we do? We squeezed it in the middle of the triangle and we said, let's see how it impacts the perimeter. Now we're saying, wait a minute, maybe the perimeter should be value, quality, and image or reputation. Maybe what's in the middle of the triangle is time, cost, and scope. How many people here are PMPs? That's good. Years ago, people used to come to hear me speak because they wanted to hear what I had to say. Now they don't care, they want PDUs. <laughs> Been a little bit of a change, eh? <clears throat> For those of you that took the PMP exam, we tested you on 10 knowledge areas, right? But the metrics we tested you on were only on two knowledge areas. Only on two knowledge areas, time and cost. What happened to the metrics in the other knowledge areas? There are metrics in the other knowledge areas. Where are they? This is what future editions of the PMBOK guide will look like. This is what it's going to look like. We're going to give you a PMBOK guide, and then we're going to give you 10 paperbacks that will have all the metrics that you can use in each one of those 10 knowledge areas. That's what the future looks like because there are metrics in each one of those areas. Definitely metrics in each one of those areas. So what does this mean for the project manager? Let's talk about what your life is going to look like in the next decade. The first thing you're going to do is to define success on your project. How do you define success on a project? When I was in industry, I was managing a project for the United States Air Force. And I reported to the VP for engineering. I walked into his office one day and I said, what's the definition of success on the project that I'm managing? And his answer was, getting the job done within the profit margins that went into the proposal. And I said, tell me, do you think the Air Force has the same definition of success? And he wouldn't answer that question. And I said, do you understand how bad this is? That I'm managing a project for the Air Force, and we both have different definitions of success? Well, today, we want you to sit down with the customer and at the beginning of the project decide what's the definition of success on that project. Then, once you come to an agreement on how you're going to define success, then you're going to go into the metric library and you and the customer will decide what metrics you're going to use 
to define success and track it. That's right. You can have different metrics on each project. Then you're going to have to make sure that whatever metrics you pick can be measured. There's no point in selecting metrics that can't be measured. Now, how are you going to get the metrics on the dashboard? Well, guess what? On every project team, you're going to have a dashboard designer. That's right. Companies are now hiring dashboard designers that work with every project team in order to make sure we design the right dashboards for those clients. And if the dashboard designers have a knowledge of project management, that would most certainly be helpful. And there are seminars on the internet not right now in how to design dashboards. That's what the future looks like. You all heard of a company called ABB, Asaya Brown Bavari? In one of my books, I had a company that does nothing but dashboard design. They design dashboards for their clients. And this small company was bought out by ABB. They said, why are we reinventing the wheel? You've got a company that designs dashboards. We're going to buy you out and then promote your services in our proposal to all of our clients all over the world. The simplest way for growth, acquisition. There are three types of metrics. The first one is the traditional metric that you have. We simply call it a metric. The second one's a KPI. And you know what's interesting? All these project management textbooks in the marketplace talk about metrics and KPIs, and many of them don't differentiate what the difference is between them. So I want to take a couple of minutes and do it. If you go out to the job site where the job is taking place and you have a camera and you take a picture of the status, that's a metric. A KPI takes that metric and extrapolates it into the future. The KPI indicates what the future of that trend will look like. All KPIs are metrics, but not all metrics are KPIs. For example, I've been telling project managers, measuring the cost variance and the schedule variance is nice, but that's not what you report to executives. You know what executives and customers want to see on dashboards? Trends. They want to see SPI and CPI. They want to know what the future looks like, not the present. They want to know where you're going to end up, how late you're going to be, will you be over budget, what value will be created. Those dashboards that go up to the executive levels are future oriented. Now the dashboards at the working levels they contain metrics and KPIs. But what goes upstairs is at the executive levels. Those are KPIs. But you'll notice I've also added in a third type of metric, which we call a value-based or a value-reflective metric. Because what we're doing now is we're creating metrics that can track the value of a project, the ongoing value of a project. And we can show that to the executives in one metric. Let's talk for a couple of minutes about governance. When I was a young project manager, governance was done by one person called the project sponsor. But if you take a look at some of these large projects today, governance is no longer in the hands of one person. It's now committee governance. And there can be several people sitting up there on the top that are involved with committee governance. Even the customer and the stakeholders are now actively involved in governance. I don't want to get into a discussion, time doesn't permit it, on who sits on these governance committees, but I want to talk about some of the headaches. Every stakeholder on the governance committee can make a different type of decision. Therefore, they all need customized dashboards. Tell me, how many metrics can you get on a computer screen and still have it legible? Usually, the target is somewhere between 6 and 10. 
And we only want the executives to see one and only one dashboard. We don't want to give them multiple dashboards. We want to give them one and only one dashboard where they can see the health of the project. And on that dashboard are six to 10 KPIs. And every stakeholder can request different KPIs because of the decisions they have to make. Therefore, I need that dashboard designer on my project designing those dashboards for each of the customers and each of the stakeholders. They're not all seeing the same dashboard. What happens if the stakeholders demand metrics that you're not familiar with? Well, how important is it to have that stakeholder's business? If you want their business, you find a way of getting that information. But that requires that you understand the metric. If you don't understand that metric, then don't do it. It's better not to do it than to put a metric up there that nobody understands. Let's make it worse. What are you going to do if the stakeholders disagree with the information that's on the screen? Now what? Now you're going to have to sit down with the stakeholders and make sure there's an agreement on what that metric actually shows. Intel asked me a good question during a seminar I did for them, a webinar. Intel said, how do we make sure that the stakeholders understand what's on the screen? And I said, the first time you show them a dashboard screen, you're going to have to sit down with them and make sure they fully understand what they're looking at on that screen. And they said, you're right. We get the picture. Let's make it worse. What happens if the stakeholders tell you they don't want to hear any bad news? They don't want to see any bad news reported on the dashboard screen. This would be a good time to update your resume. Now let's make it even worse, the worst possible scenario. What happens if the stakeholders want you to change the metrics and hide the truth? Now what? Are you going to abide by the PMI code of conduct and professional responsibility? I believe in it. I've done it my whole life. I'm not embarrassed to report bad news upstairs regardless of what they tell me. And I'm still employed. Let's talk about value metrics for a minute. I told you a few minutes ago that one of the things that's happening in the marketplace is that we're eliminating the project management life cycle. You know the life cycle we teach you in the PMBOK guide? Initiation, planning, execution, monitoring and control and closure. That's still valid, but that's only part of the investment life cycle. That's the area where you see project life cycle. Remember I told you we're now bringing project managers on board early? They're now participating in the initiation of the project. They're sitting down right at the beginning and providing their input. They're involved in portfolio management. So now they're actually involved with idea generation and project approval. And the project doesn't end when you turn the deliverable over to a client. Now, what executives and customers are asking us are the benefits achieved and are we receiving the value we want. There's a phase at the end called benefit realization management, value analysis. I need metrics for those. We're now defining metrics in each one of these categories. The project management metrics are simple. Time, cost, scope. And then we have PMOs. And we have metrics for the PMOs. But we also have another PMO that has grown significantly. And that's called the portfolio PMO. And the portfolio PMO is to make sure that the company selects the proper mix of projects to maximize the value that comes to the company. We want to maximize 
the value that comes to the company. And since we now have good measurement techniques, we can track all of those portfolio metrics you see on the right-hand side. We can now track them all. We can track every one of them. How do we track them? Let me show you some of the ways we track them, all right? There's no reason to work on a project unless it's aligned to a strategic objective. If it's not aligned to a strategic objective, throw the project out of the queue. So going across the top, I have each one of my projects. And coming down the left-hand side, I'm identifying what my strategic objectives are. And now I can match each one of my projects against the strategic objectives. There's all sorts of charts out there now that we can use to do this. What does that have to do with the project manager? Let me show you. Here's a scoring model for a project. Do you know that for almost 50 years, all you had was the left-hand side? That's all you had was right here. Nothing else, just this. Now take a look at what we've added in. Look at what we've added in now. And now we're saying that if you're working on a project, there has to be value in what you're doing. There has to be strategic value as well as financial value. So now we're assigning points to each one of these. Here's an example of the project manager assigning points to these. Right now, the scoring model here is 80 points out of 100. 80 points out of 100. I'm getting 23 out of 30 for the standard deliverables. I'm getting 32 out of 40 for strategic value. And I'm getting 25 out of 30 for financial value. And I can update this as often as you like. And I can put it on a cell phone and transmit it to you wherever you are wherever you are. And now executives are asking the following question from the portfolio PMO. What percent of the benefits have we achieved every year? What benefits did we achieve in 2012, 2013, 2014? We're now tracking total benefits achieved. Nice. You understand, of course, that I'm just scratching the surface on this, right? You get the message, just from what I've shown you so far, that there's an awful lot more. I mean, we could have been here for two to three days going through some of these slides. But what benefits are the companies achieving as a result of doing this? Tell me, what's the definition of a project management methodology? You know what my definition of a project management methodology is? It's handcuffs that we put on the project manager. Why did executives create project management methodologies? Because we didn't trust project managers to make decisions. If you don't trust project managers to make decisions, then you create methodologies and you put handcuffs on the project manager and you force them to use the methodology exactly the way it's laid out. But what happens if not all of the parts of the methodology should be used on a given project? Are you willing to give the project manager freedom? Are you willing to give the project manager the right to use only part of it? Do you know that we're now replacing methodologies with forms, guidelines, templates, and checklists? And you know what's happening the very first day of a project? The project manager will go through the cafeteria line and from the shelves, they'll take whatever forms, guidelines, templates, and checklists they need. And at the end of the line will be a cash register. They'll ring it up. And that will be the project manager's methodology for that project. And it's going to be customized to fit the client's business model. This is the principle of Agile. We're going to go to dashboard reporting.
which will eliminate a lot of the useless reports. If you eliminate useless reports, you can save money because less time is being spent in report writing. The overall result is that you'll have a significant cost reduction on your project as a result of metric management. People are under the impression that adding in metrics and dashboards will cost you more money. You're wrong. The cost saving is huge, huge. Good metrics with PM 2.0 will make it easier for you to perform trade-offs. Time, cost, scope, risk, and so on. Good metrics will make it easier for you and the stakeholders to agree on the target for the project and how you're going to define success. I hate working on projects where I don't know how to define success. With good metrics, you'll be able to get the stakeholders to agree on the direction of the project. And you should have less interference from stakeholders. With good metrics, it should be easier to take a snapshot of the project and find out the true health of the project. Something which we're unable to do with time, cost, and scope. I'll repeat myself again. It is not possible to determine the health of a project just by looking at time, cost, and scope. You can't define health and success just from those three metrics. You think you can, but you can't. Some projects require health checks. And we're now looking at what metrics should be used to define health checks. Without effective metrics, we tend to wait too long before canceling a project. One of the benefits of good metrics is it allows you to cancel a project early and then take those resources and assign them to other projects that will give you much better value. Why work on a project till it's over and then discover it should have been canceled? Good metrics allow stakeholders to make informed decisions rather than seat of the pants decisions. With good metrics, you'll discover that decision making is easier and you'll have fewer meetings. I have one company in Detroit, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, they went to metrics management, they had fewer meetings with the executives, and the PMO discovered that they were saving a million dollars a year, a million dollars a year in the elimination of useless reports and meetings with executives, all because of metrics. With good metrics, the number of conflicts will be reduced significantly. With good metrics, consensus decision-making should be easier to come by. With good metrics, it's easier to work with virtual teams. Hewlett Packard told me that every project they work on at Hewlett Packard is a virtual team, everyone. And they said their biggest challenge is knowing what metrics to provide everybody on these projects. With good metrics, you'll eliminate executive meddling. Hopefully. With good metrics, the number of questions that come from the customer and the stakeholders will be significantly reduced. With good metrics, the chances of success are significantly increased. And with good metrics, it's going to be a lot easier to come up with global partnerships in the future. And a lot of companies we're dealing with right now have discovered that. Metric management is a very strong selling point during competitive bidding. Well, I want to thank you for tolerating me for the past 45 minutes. I've only got a few minutes left, so I'll open it up for a couple of questions you may have. Any questions? Yes.
The question she asked, can you have trouble just getting through the data on the metrics? The answer is absolutely yes. You have to understand, we're just in the infancy stages on this. And as we get more mature, it's going to be easier to work with these metrics. One of the things we're doing in industry now, we're assigning somebody who's called a metric owner. We're taking certain people in the company and we're asking them to follow that metric. In other words, they look for continuous improvement activities in that metric. Better way of explaining that metric on a dashboard, better way of measuring it, better ways of reporting it. So it's usually an honor to be assigned as a metric owner. It does not come with a monetary award. It's an honorary title, okay? So we have people in companies today that have all these honorary titles of metric owners. One more question. Yes, sir. Portfolio PMO. Okay. The portfolio PMO has the ultimate responsibility for adding projects that go into the queue. Executives are part of the governance committee of the portfolio PMO, and they have the responsibility of determining how value is going to be defined and which one of those projects has the greatest value and the order in which the project should be worked on. You have metrics on the dashboard that track the value. And I can show that the value has changed. I can certainly show that in dashboard metrics. I don't have time to do it up here in 45 minutes, but I have metrics that can track the ongoing value of a on a dashboard. It's time to quit. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it.